Hello, I'm Marina Johnson, and this is Table Work, a TAPS podcast series where we interview the artists and theater makers behind our productions on what it takes to get their productions from the page to the stage. This episode features Connor Lipson. Connor is a second year PhD student who is directing a play as part of the upcoming Grad Rep. Grad Rep is a project meant to showcase the work of our second year graduate student artist scholars. Today we discuss Connor's play, Omalas. Hi, Connor. I'm so excited to talk to you about your grad rep piece, Omalas, today. Hi, Marina. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk as well. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you chose this particular piece um, and what it's, what's it about? So it's an adaptation of a short story by one of my favorite authors, Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, the short story is originally called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Um, I've been wanting to direct an adaptation of Le Guin's work for many years now um, and kind of came to it in a roundabout manner last spring, um, having reread the short story again after a few years. And it's one of the short stories that just kind of sticks with you forever once you've read it. Um, and I found that there was so something so theatrical in the text of the short story itself about the walking away from this kind of abstracted, mythic, utopian city um, that I felt just was really calling for the stage. Um, and so, yeah, it was last spring was deciding that we I wanted to do this, but I didn't necessarily feel like I had a super strong vision for how to adapt it necessarily. Um, and so I worked with a, a friend of mine who's a playwright in Chicago. We've collaborated a bunch before, Nate Smith. Um, and so they're, they've written the adaptation. We've been collaborating over the summer on that adaptation process. Um, so it's the very first time that this, uh, this version, this adaptation is being staged of this short story. I don't know of any examples of the short story ever being adapted before, but it might have. Um, but I'm really excited to stage this kind of, this new adaptation for the very first time. That is so cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process with you and Nate um, in working on the adaptation? Yes. Um, so I think that I, I approach Nate, both of us are huge Le Guin fans, and we've kind of kept a correspondence just like raving about her various works. Um, and I approach Nate with this idea for for uh, adapting this story specifically. Um, and over the summer, we had a um, there was kind of a, a decision point of whether so the short story is written like a parable it's written it's a four page short story there are no characters there's no plot um it's literally a description of the utopian city omelas and i won't spoil for you what does happen in there um but it was kind of this challenge of how do we how do we put onto the stage how do we expand a four page short story into a roughly hour long play um, and we kind of had two approaches we were deciding between. One was this kind of more abstracted, uh, post-dramatic version that was kind of mirroring the tone of the short story, which is this kind of invitational mode. The narrator is just, the narrator would be the principal character that was describing the city to the audience. Um, and we wouldn't have a plot necessarily. Uh, so that's one version. And on the other hand, there's the possibility of like narrativizing it, of like creating characters, having a story with the beginning, middle, and end, whether that's staging a day in the life of Omelas or staging some event that happens in Omelas. Um, and uh, at first, we started trying to kind of split the middle between the two, where we're like, okay, we'll have some characters, but we'll keep them archetypal to kind of maintain that tone of the short story. Um, because one of the things I love about the story most is that it's so open-ended that every person I talk to that has read it has a slightly different reading of it and a different way that they want to take the ending, which is kind of what what really attracted to me, what, what attracted me to it in the first place. Um, and so I think that was part of the impulse to want to keep it more abstracted and not wanting to narrativize it was to not kind of close down its possible meanings. Um, but ultimately, Nate, through the process of writing, was finding that it was it was kind of difficult to to not fully do either one either one of those things. Um, and we decided ultimately that we would just go the kind of full on narrativization route. Um, that was what Nate was more excited about, and I got more excited about it because Nate got more excited about it, um, and it was what kind of came natural to them in that writing process. Um, and so the last thing I'll say about that is just that I think it's been a, it's been an exciting process of like, how do we, how do we make, and how does Nate write radically specific choices that we, we don't want things to just be kind of like up in the air, it's nothing, um, while at the same time keeping it open-ended and not scripting a certain kind of experience for the audience member, because I think that's kind of antithetical to the short story. I think ultimately what we're doing is we're staging a specific reading of the short story. There is a point of view that's particular. Um, and at the same time, 
I hope that it's still, uh, I hope that it's asking more questions than proposing any answers. And I think that that's been kind of the the thin line that we've been walking through this process. I think Nate has done a great job in keeping it open ended in the right ways while making it radically specific at the same time. That is so exciting. And I mean, the line that you're talking about straddling is always such a, a difficult one. I mean, I don't do much adaptation, so I can only imagine that part. Um, but then also now on top of that, you're making directorial choices um, with design and with actors. Uh, and so I'm curious to hear a little bit about what those choices are, what the rehearsal room is like for you and the actors right now as you're sort of straddling this line still. It's been really fun. Um so you know we we've, we've been rehearsing for a couple months now very infrequently right now we've kind of got back into we're rehearsing 5 days a week for the next 3 or 4 weeks and going up in a few weeks so everything's a little bit more intense now and the script is more or less complete um but for the fall the two months we probably had 10 15 rehearsals or so spread out over the course of a month or two um maybe less, maybe probably about 10 rehearsals, but the script was super fluid. I mean, we started rehearsals and there was like a rough draft of the thing. And so it's been a exciting blend of a kind of new play development process and with some hints of devising as well, um, because there's sequences in the play that are nonverbal and there's sequences in the play that have a little bit of text, but need kind of more expansive staging. Um, uh, you know, question. Yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been exciting having, I mean, the three actors I'm working with are utterly phenomenal and are coming in with like the best ideas and so many ideas that it's, the process has been, um, one of just kind of, uh, uh, a bunch of possibilities are always there in the room. And so my job has been like, okay, that works, that works, that works rather than trying to generate the, generate the ideas about how the play is going to be staged from scratch. Um, so it's been exciting working kind of between as the script is being finalized and the way that Nate was able and excited to respond to the discoveries we were making in the room and vice versa. I think it's been like a really exciting um, process that has gone in both directions in a way. It's not been like a linear, like the playwright is writing the play, we are staging the play, and it's not been like we come up with all the ideas and Nate uh, writes based on them. I think Nate has been certainly leading the process with the text, but then we found ways to um, make choices within the room that have then influenced Nate's process. So it's been fun. It's been scary because uh, some of it is open-ended, um, but it's kind of that good kind of scary where um, there's all these possibilities and we just get to choose from them. That's, oh, it sounds so invigorating. Um, and I appreciate the, like, the gesture to like the good kind of scary, but acknowledging that like, yeah, taking risks is a scary thing, especially when you know that the, there's a show date already set. Uh, this show will go up at a particular time. Um, and what does that mean and look like and how does that influence things? But I love that it's influencing things in this really positive way where you're inviting all of the the, the risk taking and, and the choice making in these great ways. Um, I've heard rumor on the street, Connor, that this play has a really cool scenic element um, that I won't share if you don't want it to be a revealed thing. Um, but just in the realm of like choice making, I'm curious if you want to share any aspects of the design, things maybe people will see or hear uh, in this play. I don't know if what you're referring to is the shadow puppetry, um, but there is shadow puppetry in the play. Which is going to be really exciting. Um, uh, I won't. I won't give away too much about how that's going to be uh, implemented in there. Um, but it's this. I mean, we're we're responding to this. The the central challenge that um, Lana, our puppet designer, and Sid, our incredible set designer, have been and myself have been responding to is like, how do we, how do we represent a, a, an entire city? How do we tell an entire story with only three bodies on stage? There are only three actors in the whole thing, and so how do we get this sense of grandeur and abundance? Because Omalas, it's a utopian city. Everything is perfect. Everyone is happy, um, and we need to give the sense that there's no there's no material need in Omalas. Everyone has everything that they need and there's an abundance of things around. And so how do we how do we get that sense of um abundance and scale and perfection uh while only having three bodies walking on the stage? Um so we're using a combination of uh really exciting shadow puppetry with overhead projector um and this kind of incredible um curtain that Sid is playing around with with the set um to give to give the 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 illusion or the or rather the um the feeling of omelas it's been a process of not trying to just not trying to depict omelas literally um but rather trying to evoke the feeling of what it would be like to live in omelas abstractly wow 
that's not at all what I had heard. Um, I just hadn't heard about that at all, which is fascinating and fabulous. Um, and I know that you have worked with puppets and puppetry in the past. Um, so I'm really excited for the shadow puppets. Um, wow. And I mean, you really, like, there's so many directing challenges, but exciting ones. But I mean, the, the, what you're talking about creating abundance, um, but knowing that you can't show everything sort of literally. And what does that mean? Um, wow. Um, and it comes from the it comes from the text of the short. I mean, it's all coming from the text of the short story, which is written in this. Like I, I think I mentioned earlier, this invitational mode where the narrator of the short story is constantly describing the city to us, but then is leaving it up to the reader's imagination. Right? The narrator is like, it could ha Omalas could have this, or it could have this. And so it's been how do we how do we keep that mode of inviting the audience to imagine Omalas rather than trying to depict it literally um, has been kind of undergirding the entire process. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I haven't read this, but I mean, a, a four-page short story sounds like something that I should definitely um, generally read. And then as you're describing it, it sounds like a, a must. Um, what, in the, the weeks that remain, what are you most excited about exploring in the room? I mean, you've mentioned several things uh, already that I can see you taking up as that. Um, but are there particular uh, questions or, uh, I don't know, challenges that you're looking forward to discovering? So many um how to choose i think that i mean one one thing that we started the process thinking a lot about and as we're kind of getting into the weeds and the nuances of the and the particulars of how do we stage this how do we literally make all of the things happen which is what we're in blocking right now so it's a lot of like logistics and getting things in the right places and everything um, but the one question i'm excited to keep coming back to which is where we began the process is like what um what does utopia feel like? What does utopia look like? What can utopia be like? I think that um, Le Guin has written a lot and a bunch of thinkers have written a lot about the kind of limitation of the utopian imagination. Um, I think a lot of our utopias, um, in some ways Omalas included, are uh, versions of our own world just without all the bad parts. Um, and I think Le Guin's really trying to challenge us to imagine um, another kind of utopia, a utopia that might not be as predictable and might not be as imaginable. Um, and I think that in, in many ways is, is uh, for her, the project of fantasy is to imagine otherwise and imagine what might seem impossible, but to believe even if just for a moment that that thing is possible. Um, so I think coming back to over and over again in this process of like, what can utopia feel like and how do we give senses of that um in staging even if it's not necessarily in uh in the language because the language is set in omelas um yeah yeah no that makes sense one well, something i should have asked you about the design was when you and nate started working on the adaptation together did you always envision uh shadow puppetry being part of this or was that a device that you later came to to sort of get at more of these qualities of this particular utopia it's funny um we never we we were never like there will be shadow puppetry in this play um i think we always knew from the beginning you know we've worked together before on previous projects and and the projects we've worked together on um dating back to undergrad days have been um uh involving shifts in scale in some way so even if it wasn't shadow puppetry we would be going down in miniature we did a show uh in college that had a live video camera projecting the miniature action that was happening on stage blown up in real time for the audience to see um, we've done other filmed works that's been kind of entirely in miniature um, and i think that's one of the ways that i think we both found um we both thought would be really effective in staging that abundance and staging the impossible of like how do you how do you stage an abundant grand utopian city um you don't try to match that you can kind of go under it and so we're trying to like to get to the big we're going to the small i think that's one thing that we've been excited about the entire time um i don't know if either of us necessarily knew that the that the way we got to the small would be shadow um but that came that came during this fall um I, I think starting once once I started receiving drafts from Nate, I started seeing like okay, here are places where the where the shadow puppetry I think would make a lot of sense, um, and we were debating whether or not to have shadow puppetry be just part of the miniature world or whether there would be other miniatures on the stage as well. And I think ultimately we decided to make that more concise and let the shadow puppetry do a lot of a lot more work than I think either of us initially expected it to. 
Oh, I love it. The way you describe um, getting at the big by going to the small uh, is really evocative. So yeah, I'm so excited to see this on stage. Um, a question that I love and hate as a director is, what are you hoping? Are you hoping that the audience walks away thinking of a particular thing? Are you hoping they come away with their own sort of uh, questions or thoughts about Utopia? Yes, I don't, I don't, I don't ever really want to tell the audience what to think or what to feel. Um, certainly not me as a director. Like you're not going to find a director's note in the program for this. I don't think um, we're going to let the show do what it does. Um, but I mean, I, I think I think one thing that I would I would I hope that the show does, and one thing I would invite everyone to think about is um, or to explore while they're watching the show is like what I was talking about earlier about about utopia and how do we like how do we imagine do we imagine a better world is it worth imagining a better world um and how do we how do what, what is our relationship to the impossible right um i think that to me that's that's like that's what Le Guin's project in fantasy is and in many ways that's connecting to my own research about fantasy as a genre um just looking at looking at what like what what is it what does it do for us to sit with something that seems impossible for an hour um, and like live in that for a little bit, what can that open up possibilities wise um, is really exciting to me. What is our relationship to the impossible? That's beautiful. Um, and I do love, I mean, if you want to say even just a little bit more, I know it's always hard to sort of summarize research, but like you you do work on fantasy and this feels like such a beautiful example of an artist scholar um, sort of taking things that they're doing in their academic work onto the stage. Um, but would love to hear just a little bit more for people who are listening about your own research outside of this as well, though linked. Yes, I'm still figuring a lot of this out, um, but I will say that uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm kind of an avid fantasy genre lover from the outside um my entire life whether that's been books or movies or plays or whatever it's i've kind of just always gravitated towards magic and towards the impossible and towards fantastical worlds um and i think that um one of the things i'm really interested in, in researching and something i've been trying to dive into as much as possible is like what can fantasy do on stage that it can't do on the page or on the screen um and to me, that gets that gets to that question I was talking about earlier about like what what does utopia or throw away utopia like what is what is what is fantasy or what do alternative worlds what do other possibilities like feel like in our bodies? Um, I think it, like books are amazing; they can make us think and they can make us ask really interesting questions. Um, but I think what live performance can do that other mediums struggle to to the same degree is like let a group of people collectively imagine another world in space together um, and let people feel that in our bodies. Um, so we have a kind of sensory um, uh, embodied relationship to these ideas that that we're exploring in the play. Um, and I think wedding, wedding, wedding uh, our questions, um, even if they're open-ended and unanswerable and impossible, wedding those questions with a kind of visceral or intense experience like in our bodies in space, wedding those two things together, I think strengthens both of them in really exciting ways. And so I'm really excited about looking into and finding language to describe this experience that um, I have whenever I see an alternative in front of me or or something in front of me and I have this kind of visceral experience and I know that there's something that it does with that kind of real phenomenological presence that it doesn't do if I'm just by myself reading a book or on the couch watching a movie. Um, so I'm really trying to dive into into that phenomenological embodied experience of spectatorship. That is so beautifully put, Connor. Um, I have so enjoyed getting to hear about your work and this play that we all get to watch very soon. Um, thank you for sharing this with us. Um, and yes, we look forward to getting to talk with you afterwards. Thank you very much. I'm excited for you all to see. <laughs>